Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see so many friendly faces. And uh, welcome to the Washington Institute. Our topic today, as you know, is President Tr Trump's invitation and uh, the visit of uh, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. This is only the second time in seven years uh, that President Abbas is here in Washington for and will be holding meetings at the White House on Wednesday. Uh, and so to discuss this uh, event, we've, we've really got, a, I think, a really interesting panel for you all. These, these are names that are, are familiar to you. Uh, Raythel Omari uh, is someone who um, you know who worked once for President Abbas uh, many years ago, was at Camp David has been with uh, the Washington Institute for the last several years as a close colleague and, we're, and focuses a lot on Palestinian politics and, and the peace issue as well. So we're really thrilled that he's here. Uh, and another veteran Washington Institute person who you know is a familiar face to all of us and to every television home in Israel, Ehud Yari, uh, Israel's leading commentator on the Middle East and really who's been with the Washington Institute since the inception. And we're really thrilled. Uh, he's, he's a visiting fellow here from time to time, and we're really th thrilled that we could tap into his expertise today. So welcome, Ehud. And uh, Dennis Ross, who needs no introduction uh, to, to this audience. Uh, myself, we'll, we'll be having um, uh, a lively discussion. We're going to try to keep our remarks tight in order to maximize the Q&A. So without further ado, I turn it over to my colleague, uh, Raythel Omari. All right. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, what I'm going to try to do in, this, uh, in my remarks is to talk a bit about the political context in which Abbas uh, is coming to Washington talk about how this will affect the dynamic of the uh, summit on Wednesday, and maybe conclude with a couple of uh, recommendations for the U.S. administration, and try to do all of that in eight minutes. So uh, it will be telegraphic, uh, but I'll try to cover as much as I can in this time. So where is Abbas today politically? I, I would say he is in an almost uh, paradoxical situation. He is both strong, but also in a shaky, uh, volatile, or a fragile uh, position. He's strong in the sense that only last summer um, he convened the conference for his Fatah uh, movement. He managed to get uh, elected as the leader again, managed to get his supporters elected to key positions in the uh, movement. And today he's in full control of all of the machinery of uh, the Fatah movement. Also, regionally speaking, diplomatically speaking, while last summer he was uh, in many ways being shunned and pressured by some regional actors, the renewed interest by President Trump in the peace process has uh, brought Abbas back again into the regional uh, limelight. We just saw before he came to Washington, he met with uh, President Sisi, with King Abdullah. Leaders who were unwilling to talk to him uh, a few months ago right now are dealing with him as a central figure. This gives him a feeling of strength, but this is also very fleeting and very shaky strength. In the sense that, domestically speaking, as he consolidated uh, his control over Fatah, he did that at the expense of alienating some key constituencies uh, in Fatah. What we're seeing today, for example, there's a hunger strike by many Palestinian prisoners led by uh, Marwan Barghouti. Marwan Barghouti managed to get the highest votes in the Fatah conference, received no uh, positions, his supporters were not elected. And therefore, what we're seeing, Barghouti and others creating a show of force vis-a-vis -vis Abbas and reminding him that he has still opponents within the uh, Palestinian system. So his margin of maneuver is restricted despite his control over Fatah. And in regional terms, while some of the leaders uh, are willing to talk to him, this is not because they have seen any change in the substance of the peace process or, or any renewed confidence in Abbas per se, but because they understand that uh, since President Trump is focusing on this, they have to engage Abbas. If the American focus goes somewhere else, Abbas's significance also goes somewhere else. So this is the general context in which he is coming, which will dictate the dynamics of what he will try to achieve in the meeting on Wednesday. On Wednesday, he will come with two contradictory uh, dynamics. On the one hand, 
he would need to produce sustained engagement. He would need the meeting to produce sustained engagement with the United States so he can leverage that to maintain his relevance diplomatically. On the other hand, because of his weaknesses, because of his domestic pressures, he is afraid that he will get difficult asks, difficult uh, demands from the meeting that he will be difficult, that will be difficult for him politically to address. In particular, two things uh, stand out that he is worried about. The first, he is afraid that there will be a clear, strong ask for him to stop what uh, is called martyr funds or support that the PA pays to uh, uh, pr prisoners or to the families of uh, terrorists engaged in some uh, terrorist activities. This is something that has become very significant in the Washington conversation. It's something that is politically difficult for him to deliver, particularly in the midst of a, an ongoing hunger strike. So this is one that he is afraid to be uh, tossed with. And the other one that he's afraid of is something that actually uh, President Trump mentioned in his press conference with Prime Minister Netanyahu. He's afraid of a peace process, of a process that has a regional dimension, not only a bilateral dimension. He's afraid of that because it will put him again under the pressure of Arab leaders with whom he has tense relations, and it will dilute the centrality of the Palestinian players in the peace process. Instead, he will try to deflect attention into different uh, uh, issues. He will try to build on the security successes that have been happening over the last years, and rightly so. He would like to capitalize on the interest of the Trump administration in economic development. He might be willing to even uh, offer abandoning some of the diplomatic internationalization efforts that he has been engaged in recently, going to the UN, etc particularly because these efforts have lost direction and have hit uh, a dead wall, uh, a dead end, and as such, uh, he feels that he can uh, do away with them. But most importantly, what he will try to do is to offer President Trump the resumption of a bilateral U.S.-Palestinian uh, peace talk solely under U.S. Uh, uh, auspices, i.e. without the uh, regional component. He has already uh, indicated that uh, in a, an interview he gave to a Japanese newspaper recently. He said he was willing to meet with Prime Minister Netanyahu under the auspices of President Trump. He will try to present these as a way of uh, deflecting from some of the more difficult tasks, particularly that Abbas himself, you know, his comfort zone is within managing a diplomatic negotiation process. He felt that he survived this under uh, Bush and under uh, Obama, and he thinks that he can maneuver it under Trump. What does this mean? And I will conclude with this. What does this mean for uh, the U.S. and what, how should the U.S. approach this? I would say in the meeting on Wednesday, I would counsel the president to be both firm but gentle. Firm in the sense that we, Abbas needs to leave the meeting with a difficult, with a specific, with a meaningful ask something like the prisoner's issue, something of this sort. This is important in its own right. These are issues that have to be addressed, but it's also important in order to explore whether or not Abbas has the ability or the willingness to make difficult decisions. If he's unable to make these kinds of decisions, it's very hard to imagine him being able to make the kind of decisions that one would require uh, in reaching a peace deal. By the way, this is what uh, the president, this is what the US did with Israel. Uh, Netanyahu came here. He was uh, asked to do something politically difficult for him, something about settlements. And so something similar has to be done with Abbas. So this is the firm part. The gentle part, though, is we have to realize, as Abbas comes here, that he might not be able to deliver on some of these things today. If we ask him right now to uh, stop these payment payments immediately, he probably will be unable to do that. So what we should offer instead is to engage him in a process through which we will work with him to reach these objectives through a defined timeline, through defined benchmarks. Again, similar to the dynamic that we have created with Israel, whereby the US is now engaging Israel to figure out what's a slowdown on settlement. Looks like we need to do something similar with uh, Abbas. This kind of approach will create a dynamic whereby there is an ongoing engagement, a process of US-Palestinian uh, uh, engagement, but not on terms dictated by uh, the PA, i.e. diplomatic uh, engagement, but rather on terms dictated by the U.S. meant to probe the Palestinian ability to uh, reach a deal. On Wednesday, if President Trump asks for too much and too uh, quick, Abbas might shut down and, we might end, and he might retreat to his uh, decide to preserve his uh, domestic standing and nothing will come out of the meeting. On the other hand, 
if the president asks for too little and is willing to engage on a diplomatic process with no uh, preparation, we might end up with a very familiar story of a, a peace process, of a negotiation, where neither or one of the sides is uh, willing or able to reach a deal and we're just being strung along. The, ba the balance has to be reached between a meaningful ask and at the same time a process in which we work with the Palestinians to reach this uh, objective. With this, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the question and answer. Ehud. Good afternoon. Not for the same time I agree with uh, much that my colleague uh, Race was uh, telling you. Uh, but I see Abbas differently. I see Abbas becoming moodier than ever, capable of temperamental uh, outbursts more often than before, becoming extremely suspicious of everybody around him, removing people who were historically, traditionally very close to him. When he felt, for example, lately, that the chief of his uh, security, who's also, in many ways, his top diplomat, uh, General Majid Farage, is becoming or is perceived to be too strong, he immediately sort of spanked him uh, in public. He's very, very uh, 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 busy with maintaining the right balance between potential contenders for succession. Uh, people who are close to him will tell you that he was never easy to live with, to work with, more so now. So this is the the man who's coming to see uh, the president. That's his mood. This, that's his frame of mind. Now, number one, in spite of this uh, sudden spate of uh, optimism that uh, the Trump administration can do it, and even the new uh, a PLO uh, representative in uh, Washington, Hossam Zumlot, uh, believes that it's uh, possible. Well, I will argue that no major breakthrough is available now. No lack of effort or shortage of time prevented the deal so far over the many years since uh, Oslo. Uh, nothing has changed in that. Not, not go into that. I'll just remind you uh, that uh, once somebody involved, even recently, in the uh, uh, track two negotiations over peace, uh, wrote once the article, a famous article, in which he says, thanks, but no thanks, but no thanks to a Palestinian state. The closest people to Abbas will tell you that you offer him 67 lines. Is Jerusalem as a capital? The answer is no. Or rather, the answer is, I'll come back, I'll get back to you, Mr. President, as he said to President Obama. He is not the man who's going to sign a deal giving up on the return of many, many refugees. It's not him. And everybody around him knows it and will tell you privately that this is the case. Second, politically, I think that uh, we're not talking uh, uh, Israel today, but I don't think Bibi has the numbers to go for a substantial uh, deal. And I'm not going to play now with the arithmetics, certainly not with the coalition he uh, uh, has. 
And I think uh, Abbas in, in not only doesn't have the will to go long distance, but he doesn't have the uh, popular support. He is dramatically losing control of segments and sectors of the uh, West Bank uh, geography and demography. He doesn't control the refugee camps, and they are important. And a myriad, an array of Tanzim, Fatah Kaders, armed groups, not unified as they were under Arafat and Marwan Barghouti, is challenging and is going to challenge the predominance of the official security forces of the Palestinian Authority. My count, they have roughly the same number of guns by now. And the most important player uh, on them and amongst the Tanzim is uh, a gentleman by the name of Mahmoud al Alul, who was given the, by uh, Abbas now the number two position in Fatah in order to balance Jibrin Rajub's number two position in the PLO. So the main objective of uh, Abu Mazen, of Abbas coming to Washington, in my humble opinion, is to control potential damage. That's the main mission. This administration talks differently. Jason Greenblatt doesn't talk to him like Martin Indyk did. It's not the same language. It's not the same requirements. And he hears the voices. He wants to cut the potential damage. And he understands that in order to do that, uh, he will need to perform the necessary diplomatic acrobatics. And Raid pointed correctly to the fact that this is his zone of comfort. He knows to handle negotiations. He handled many negotiations, and he managed to get out of it. Uh, yes, he will be uh, willing to reduce, maybe even to switch from waging international lawfare against Israel to pressure on Hamas. David asked me to say uh, something on Hamas, and I will do that right away. I think many have uh, ignored a very important speech last year delivered by Khaled Mashal, the outgoing chairman of the wrongly called political bureau, rightly called the executive committee of uh, Hamas in Qatar. He basically said, we have, made a ma we have committed a major mistake by insisting to maintain and maintaining exclusive Hamas control in the Gaza Strip. That was a mistake, says Mashal. <coughs> I believe, in spite of all the talk, and I've read uh, much of what was published uh, about the new leader of Hamas, uh, Yahya Sanwar. I happen to know him quite uh, well, meeting him many times when he was in Israeli uh, jail. Uh, I believe what Hamas wants to, has in mind now, Yahya Sanwar, is to become a Hezbollah in the Gaza Strip. No governance. They have no interest in governance, and they are being pressured now, as I'm sure most of you know, by Hamas cutting the budget for um, uh, the electric uh, fuel for the electricity. The the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Cutting the uh, funding for electricity, reducing salaries, etc. And there is probably more to come. Uh, so far, there is something, some option there. So far, Abbas has proven to have very weak knees when it comes to, 
showing the flag in Gaza. He could have visited there. He could have uh, Palestinian security at the uh, border termi terminals, etc. I don't know that it's changing. And as an Israeli, I'm saying Israel will have to think very uh, seriously whether it's indeed our interest. But I believe <coughs> that uh, there is a possibility emerging now for a sort of cohabitation, cohabitation in uh, Gaza if it is encouraged. I don't know that this is where the United States uh, uh, want to go. Uh, I'll end, I'll end by with two notes. One is about the succession. There will no be, not be, I believe, there will not be a successor to Abbas. There will be a coalition, a triumvirate, or maybe four, who will share the different <coughs> pos positions. One will be Secretary General of the PLO, and one will be Secretary General of the Central Committee of Fatah, and the other will be Prime Minister of the PA, etc. It's very important, I think, by now, uh, to have the discussions uh, encompass these people too. Whether Abbas really likes it or not. And there are ways uh, to do that. And finally, this point. I think for many years now, embarking upon a final status effort is going once again to back backfire. It will prove elusive. It's not there. It's simply not there. I hope it will be someday, but it's not there now. And therefore, the question, the big question is whether the Trump administration, whoever will be directly involved in the process, and yes, I think that Abbas will indeed say to the president, I'm willing to enter a new phase of uh, negotiations, whether they will come to the table with a fallback a fallback which can only be some formula, some version of an interim, a comprehensive, generous interim, but interim, encompassing most of the territory of the West Bank, but not all of it. That would be a major achievement. Thank you. So, I'm trying to think about, uh, you know, the phrase, how is this night different from all other nights? How is this visit different from all other visits? And in, in a strange way, it might be something actually working for a boss, as I try to think of what, what's working for him and what are the challenges he faces. And it's, I think it's a commonality you've heard so far in this panel, is one thing working for him is incredibly low expectations. And that could work for him. Um, it's very radically different, uh, the situation, the context now, than when it was the last time he was here. Um, I was in the government then, and uh, there was some hope, I must say not among all of us, uh, that he would be receptive to President Obama's offer. There was a context, there was a very active um, negotiation track that was going on under the Obama administration. In, on March 17th, 2014, when Abbas was here last. Nobody believes that today. And uh, as you've also heard from our previous speakers, uh, there's a sense that the Palestinians are on a cusp of succession, even though it's very murky, and it will probably be collective, not uh, one person emerging so quickly. But there's no context for talks for a grand deal. 
And uh, the, the leadership has not, on both sides, Israeli and Palestinian, I don't think the Venn diagram overlaps sufficiently that there's enough convergence between the parties. And I think Washington has absorbed this. Uh, and it's kind of baked into the cake in terms of lower expectations. Ironically, the one person who doesn't talk like that is the President of the United States. <laughs> and the President of the United States still talks about the deal, the ultimate deal. So the person who wrote The Art of the Deal wants to write the sequel. Now, does he genuinely believe? Or uh, after 100 days of, of Trump, are we learning that there's a curve that Trump's whole approach is stake out an extreme position and work back from that. It could be 15% corporate taxes. It could be on a range of issues. And it might be, I'm going to do the deal. And maybe he believes, unless he gets people excited about the deal, the ultimate deal, then they won't even get to do less than the deal. So whether it's tactical with this president or not, it's, it's hard to know. But I, I think it's fair to say he doesn't have a political base that is urging him, this is at the top of your priority list. And yet he wants to do it. But he's coming, and no, but there's no expectations. And I think for Abbas, this is, when I, talk, when I list on the ledger, what are the opportunities for him? I don't think, A, low, low expectations. I think it helps him. Second, I think the fact he's never met Trump, this is an introductory meeting. This is not uh, a deliverables meeting. I mean, Netanyahu also had his meeting early on with Trump. You know, I think Bibi likes the idea, come early before there's a policy review. If there's no policy review, there's not yet policy recommendations. In this case, there's not really a staff either. So, I mean, the, the point is that coming early, and this is still fairly early on in the administration, I think for um, Abbas, low expectations, and here's your one chance to, uh, you know, they say you have one chance to make a first impression that way. So I, I think that cuts for him. I think uh, another thing that cuts for him is, is he's heard enough buzz coming out of Washington and the Greenblatt visits about more economic uh, developments that could emerge. Um, you know, there's been press reports that the only people whose foreign aid isn't going to be cut and might even go up a little bit are, are the Palestinians, even though they have been cut. I mean, they used to get over 200 million dollars in direct budgetary assistance that was basically cut out when Fayyad left office. I can go through the other numbers with you, AID numbers, et cetera. Another thing cutting for Abbas is I think he feels that, that the, the fervor to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem has cooled in the administration, that there's no signs of preparations that the administration is going to. Um, uh, come June 1st will be the first time this president Will, uh, would be forced, is he going to sign a waiver uh, to move the embassy? Under U.S. law, every six months, they need to sign under national security purposes. Obama signed December 1st. June 1st is the date. Now, it turns out that June 1st is five days before the 50th anniversary of the 1967 war that uh, where Israel united Jerusalem. So could Trump be going to Israel on May 23rd, 24th, which just coincidentally is the 50th anniversary on the Hebrew calendar, people haven't noted this yet, of the 67 war. And it's called Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day, and, uh, you know, could that be a time? But right now the fever has cooled, so could Trump be going in his view, uh, well, I won't move the embassy, but I'll make a trip. I'll, I'll, I'll give a speech. I'll do something. So I think go, if I had to do a ledger, cutting for Abbas is that you know, and here maybe the Arab states have, have helped him out a little bit. Um, and maybe he's also, as Ehud uh, and, and, and Wraith suggest, maybe he's even coming to signal to Trump. I'm starting to get tougher on Hamas. I'm not paying electricity bills for them. I'm cutting uh, the pensioners of, of, of the Palestinian security forces. I used to, a lot of my budget would go to the Gaza. I'm not doing that anymore. And look, a third, only a third of the Fatah prisoners are in this hunger strike. Two thirds of Fatah are not in it. I don't know if I want to strengthen Marwan Barghouti in jail. You know, he's a rival to him. So he might be signaling certain things. But the commonality is, I think, is it's all about short of a deal. It's not about a grand deal. Um, and could he be saying, as, that, as, as was noted earlier about that Japanese interview, about I'm willing to meet Netanyahu under Trump's auspices, I'm willing to jettison all my preconditions that I've had for the last seven years 
to meet Netanyahu. I haven't met him since 2010. They've had a few phone conversations, but not much more. So, um, so basically, um, you know, could he be saying, look, I, you're going to be out in Israel. You could preside over the first meeting in seven years. But to me, it gets to the question, so what? What, what is the context? What does it lead to? Where is it going? And this gets to the challenges for Abbas, which is if there's low expectations of a grand deal and that the administration doesn't believe that Abbas or Netanyahu are capable of the home run, as I like to call it, uh, what, what's the single? What is the thing that gives us a direction, if not yet a destination? For Netanyahu, I think it, it's clear. Uh, Dennis and, and I wrote a transition paper about, the, uh, you know, the idea of differentiation among settlements and, you know, making clear you're not going to build uh, beyond the security barrier. Seventy-six to eighty-five percent of Israelis who live in that area live within the security barrier, uh, and and a, a few people. It's still not a relevant number. It's still ninety thousand people live in in the remainder of the ninety-two percent of the West Bank, but the large majority live inside. So Netanyahu took a step. I would say a half a step, a quarter step, but he took some step. So I think the administration is going to say, "Is where's your step? What are you doing? We're done. This isn't the Obama years anymore. We're not just putting the onus on Israel." to say you've got to act on settlements. Yes, they have to act, but you have to act too. And I think a single isn't easy for him because uh, he's used to eight years of the other way. And um, this would be a shift. Uh, is he capable of, of, of withholding money from these martyrs' foundations uh, to families of stabbers, suicide bombers, or where the prisoners who commit violence get triple the salary of everybody else? Is he capable of that? Uh, if he is, I, my bet is that uh, President Trump will be able to hold off Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, who would like to do a Taylor Force Act, and in the name of an American who was a West Point graduate and an officer who was stabbed in Jaffa during uh, Vice President Biden's visit, and he'll say, look, I won't cut them off completely like Graham wants to do, but you got to give me something. If you give me something, I can hold off Lindsey Graham. If you don't, you're on your own. Um, but there are things he could also do, I think, Trump, that could help Israel. Um, I mean, that could help Abbas. And this is something that I don't see in the conversation in Washington that much, and maybe you'll say uh, too hard to do, but I, I don't know if it is. The Gulf states really want to get Trump engaged on the Iran issue, as we all know. Um, and yet, a lot of Abbas's problems are not just with Israel, but with the Gulf states. So you have this very unusual situation that the people that should be helping the PA are countries like the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia. They kind of see themselves in the same pragmatic Sunni camp. And yet, they've got their own squabbles with him uh, over Mohammed Dahlan. It's gone on forever uh, with the crown prince of the Emirates. Uh, as they, every, in Washington, everyone has to have an acronym, MBZ, you know, Mohammed, Mohammed bin Zayed. What if Trump would say, listen, you start delivering for me on some of these singles, I'm going to deliver for you. I'm going to call Mohammed bin Zayed, and I'm going to try to get them to start funding you again and put aside this Dachlan. They might not ever forget it, but maybe that it will minimize it. And maybe the same with the Saudis, too, which have cut their contribution to the Palestinians. And I'll talk to Sisi. Yes, as Wraith alluded to, Abbas being invited to Washington made him suddenly relevant regionally. Uh, suddenly, Sisi said, oh, why don't you come visit in Cairo? Uh, Abdullah met him in Jordan. So he knows a ticket to Washington isn't just a ticket to Washington. It's a ticket to other uh, Gulf leaders and uh, Arab Sunni leaders. And this, I think, would, would be very helpful to Abbas. And I think it would be helpful to the cause of succession to ease Gulf-Palestinian uh, relations. Um, and I think another piece here for him would be to say, um, we got to work out a system that you see any Sunni Israeli cooperation is coming at your expense. Because the Palestinians think we got the, the ultimate Trump card, excuse the, <laughs> excuse the pun. The Trump card being that, uh, you know, that they, the Israelis won't have any entree to the Sunnis without us. And I think they're half right. Uh, the Sunnis are not going above the table with the Israelis in a meaningful way. There's, you know, I could point to a visit of somebody or somebody a lower level, but on a meaningful way. But 
they're not blocking the Sunnis and Israelis working together under the table. Tamir Pardo, the former head of the Mossad, has reported in the Israeli press of having told Netanyahu him and his predecessor, Mayor Dagan, Israel's the mistress of the Middle East. Everyone wants to be with us, just not in public. And so uh, the question is, could there be some more modus vivendi to avoid this zero-sum approach that, Pal that the Palestinians don't have to worry, oh, they're gonna, there's going to be a, an embassy in Riyadh. I think they know there's not going to be an Israeli embassy in Riyadh or Abu Dhabi. Uh, but on the other hand, there are going to be things they're going to do together. There's got to be a synchronizing of expectations in that Sunni Israel Palestinian triangle that I think uh, brings things more into some sort of realistic alignment than there is today, where the Palestinians are against everything and are convinced that the Israelis are making these inroads. And, and yet the Israelis really know that there will not be a Riyadh first uh, peace. So, if the beginning of the Trump period, just to summarize, is um, it should be a time of realism, of, of, of realigning expectations by everybody, by Trump, by, by the Palestinians and the Israelis, and what is possible. Because short of the grand deal, short of the home run, there are some singles here. And I think everyone would be better off by trying to advance the runner. Thank you all very much. So, you know, David loves to use baseball metaphors, um, if you hadn't noticed that. <laughs> Home runs, singles. So I'm batting cleanup, okay? <laughs> now, when you bat cleanup, it means that everybody has said everything in advance of what you were going to say, and so you decide, all right, so I'll have to rethink what I was going to say. So I've decided to rethink what I was going to say. First, I'm going to start off with something that will shock you. There's no big deal here, all right? The, whether you call it the ultimate deal or the big deal. To put this in perspective, I've been working on this issue for 30 years, and I, would, I can safely say we are at a low ebb between Israelis and Palestinians today. Not a low ebb in terms of level of violence, that's not the case, thankfully, but a low ebb in terms of complete disbelief uh, on both sides. I don't know that we have ever been as um, widely separated psychologically as we are today, the combination of the psychological gap and the practical gaps on the issues and the political gaps make it impossible to go from where we are to producing the ultimate deal. Uh, the, the question becomes, you know, what does one do in light of that? If we know anything about the Middle East, the one thing we know is whenever there's a vacuum, the worst forces fill it. We've seen it in Iraq where basically we changed the regime but didn't really have a plan for what came next <clears throat> and the worst forces filled it. We've seen it in Syria where our fear of recreating an Iraq led us to a strategy of avoidance which helped to contribute to a vacuum and the worst forces filled it. We've seen it in terms of the effort on uh, diplomacy with the Israelis and the Palestinians where the basic approach unfortunately in the year 2014 was basically all or nothing. We were going to solve the conflict in nine months, and if we didn't, basically we did nothing, and it created a vacuum where the worst forces have filled it, uh, or at least psychologically where the gap between the two sides has become uh, much more severe, much wider than it's been before. So this is the setting, this is the context in which Mahmoud Abbas comes to Washington. Now, the president, whether it's because David suggests because the way he gets at the ultimate deal or the art of the deal is by coming out with very expansive statements to begin with and that sort of shapes everybody's approach to how they should deal with him or it's because he genuinely believes that there is an ultimate deal that can be there and as he said this past week, there's no reason uh, why there shouldn't be an agreement. Uh, well, he may soon find out in his meetings with <laughs> Mahmoud Abbas that there are some reasons why there may not be an agreement. But I do think that his approach to the meetings with Abbas needs to be, in the first instance, to demonstrate the difference from Obama. Uh, now, that comes naturally to him. <laughs> I mean, basically, everything the administration does is to highlight the differences with their predecessor. By the way, it doesn't make it unusual. Almost every administration, almost every president, when they come in, they want to show how different they were from the predecessors. Believe me, having been in five administrations, I can tell you 
I've seen this repeatedly. So it's not unique to this administration, but in this particular case, it's important. Why do I say that? Well, you know, one of the interviews that Abbas gave at one point that uh, always stood out with me was when he gave this interview and with pride he said, I've said no to Obama 12 times. And this was kind of an emblem for him. This is how I stand up to the United States. The one thing that can't be the result of this meeting is that Abbas leaves and feels it's okay to say no to Trump. He needs to understand when you say no to Trump, you pay a price when you say no to Trump. Trump needs to establish he's different. Uh, he's different in all sorts of ways. One thing he should be clear on is what he says he will do, he will do. He will deliver on what he says. Now, it also means when you say no to him, you're going to pay a price. That should be an objective that he has uh, for this meeting. Now, does he have leverage? Yes, he has leverage with the boss. And you heard it. You heard it actually from, from Wraith and from David, uh, and to some extent from Ehud. The leverage comes from the reality that at this point, a boss has to show he's relevant. Uh, it isn't an accident, as both Wraith and David said, about suddenly Sisi and Abdullah deciding that they wanted to see him. It was because President Trump, by inviting him here to Washington, demonstrated he was relevant. But President Trump can also determine whether he continues to be relevant. You, know, you look at the setting within the Palestinian Authority right now, you look at the polling, he is profoundly unpopular. He, Abbas, is profoundly unpopular. The PA is perceived by 80% of the Palestinians of the West Bank as being corrupt. Yes, he has carried off a general conference. He has cemented his control. But the readiness to challenge him, you see very clearly with what Juan Bar Barghouti is doing with the, uh, with the prisoner's strike, the hunger strike. So he needs to show that he is relevant. He needs to show he's relevant both for his own purposes in, in front of Palestinians, but also within the region itself. And it is true here again that there is a kind of reverse linkage going on. You know, the linkage concept historically was you really couldn't solve anything in the Middle East unless you solved the Palestinian problem. You couldn't change the American position uh, in the region uh, unless you could solve the Palestinian problem. You couldn't create any connections for the Israelis with the Arabs unless you solved the Palestinian problem. Well, there are relations with the Israelis below the radar screen with the Arabs because they have a, a common set of needs, a common set of threats. But the, where the reverse linkage comes in, ironically, is that the leading uh, Sunni states, and especially the, the leading states in the Arabian Peninsula, want the U.S. to be in the region. And they're not entirely certain, even though they see a difference in terms of rhetoric. They've seen the strike in Syria. They see some indications this administration is different from Obama, but they're not entirely convinced that between the increasing production of oil through shale here and the idea that maybe after Raqqa and after Mosul, ISIS is gone, maybe this administration will decide that they're gonna they'll withdraw. They want us in the region. Now the irony is they perceive President Trump being genuinely interested in the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And to the extent to which they, come, they become convinced that the way to keep him in the region is by showing they'll do something on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, the irony is they may be using the Palestinian issue to keep him in the region. But that's also an interesting form of leverage for him. He can ask things of them, but he can also use that with the Palestinians. So how does he approach the meeting with Abbas? Well, the first thing is as Wraith was saying, he has to ask him something. Now, Wraith came up with um, the, and I've known Wraith for how long? Um, 17 years. I met him first, actually, I think at Camp David, right? Or was it at Bowling? Just before. Bowling? At Bowling. Just before, yeah, yeah, Bowling Air Force Base, um, which just shows that negotiators have ways of building relationships. Race approach was the natural negotiator's approach, which was to say he has to ask, it has to be clear, but it also has to be gentle. He has to be hard, but he also has to be gentle. Hard because Abu Mazen has to understand he can't leave here without having responded, or at least making it clear he will respond to what the president is asking, but gentle in the sense that he needs to understand 
the real context in which Abu Mazen is operating, and he needs to give him the space and the time to be able to respond to the ass. The ass have to be real, but there also has to be a timeline. So there doesn't have to be an immediacy, immediacy of response. There just has to be the certainty of response. So while Abu Mazen will try to get away with, I'm prepared to resume negotiations, and maybe even suggest, look, when you come, you can, you can preside over the meeting. That's nice, but it's purely symbolic. Precisely because of the gaps that I was describing at the beginning, if you bring the two leaders together, I can tell you it's a one-off. It doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't do anything to change the way they see each other. None of the negotiate that, that kind of a meeting won't be prepared in terms of producing a set of understandings that lead somewhere. The one thing that the diplomacy now has to do, given how wide the gaps are, given the depth of this, the disbelief, if you want the two publics to take a second look, not to suddenly believe, because when you lose belief, it's like losing faith. When you lose faith, this is not a light switch where you flip it and suddenly everything's okay. You have to give the publics on each side a reason to take a second look. The only reason they take a second look is if you can come and you can show, you know what, something is different this time. Oslo began in September of 1993, at least publicly. So here we are in 2017. If you want either the Israelis or the Palestinians to believe that diplomacy can lead anywhere, you have to show that it's beginning to do something differently. Something is changing and something is changing on the ground. Not internationalizing the conflict, fine, but it's not changing anything. Having a one-off meeting doesn't change anything. So the ass have to be related to sending signals that each side's public will look at and say, gee, maybe something is different this time. Now, the ass that, I mean, I would have two ass. Wraith, you raised one. The, the one on the Martyrs Foundation. Uh, it is very hard for him because this is part of the Palestinian narrative now. The whole concept of resistance, the whole notion of struggle. Uh, this has become, in a sense, part of their identity. But the fact is, every time you reward somebody for killing an Israeli, you're basically saying it's okay to kill Israelis and the idea of coexistence is really not legitimate. That has to end. It has to be clear that, and this president has to say, if you're telling me you're serious about peace and you want me to play a major, major role and I'm prepared to do that, then you have to prove to me that you're serious about peace. And the proof is that in fact, you don't continue to legitimize the idea of killing Israelis. That has to stop. Now, race notion is, okay, I'll work out with you a way to do it so you don't have to do it tomorrow, but you have to do it. For me, there would be another ask as well. Uh, these are two national movements competing for the same space. That's the essence of this conflict. Two national movements, two national identities. Uh, one of the reasons two states for two peoples is the only real answer is because you're not going to get these two separate national identities coexisting in one state. That's a prescription for an enduring conflict. It's not a prescription for trying to end it. So I'm not saying at this point Abu Mazen has to sign up to the idea of a Jewish state. I am saying he has to acknowledge at some point that there's two national movements competing for the same space. There are two national identities. Uh, these two national identities require two states for two peoples. That is something he can say. And it is something, again, the timing of it is less important than the reality of doing it. He will resist these things, but this is where the president says to him, I, I'm going to ask hard things of Netanyahu just as I'm going to ask hard things of you. Uh, what I've done so far with Netanyahu, that's not the sum total of what I'm going to be asking of him. Just as I'm asking you to demonstrate and send a signal to the Israelis, I'm going to ask him to send a signal to the Palestinians. Meaning that, in fact, his settlement policies are consistent with a two-state outcome. The current limitation doesn't meet that threshold. Building only in the blocks would. Now, is that something that this Israeli government can do? It's going to be very hard for them to do it. But that, again, gets back to the idea the president is saying, if I'm going to go for trying to transform things, I'm going to do it on the basis of each side having to take hard steps. These hard steps won't produce the big deal. But what the hard steps can do is break the stalemate and restore a sense of possibility. 
what exists today in, in the region and what exists between Israelis and Palestinians today is a sense that there is no possibility. And peacemaking can't work in a context where there's no sense of possibility. Break the stalemate, restore a sense of possibility. That might actually be a double day, but not a single. The point is that the conditions to create a permanent status agreement don't exist today. Ehud talked about a long-term interim agreement. One thing about Ehud is he has consistently viewed that for a very long time. Uh, and you know, the question becomes, even if you want to do a long-term interim agreement, you got to break the stalemate first. You can't do a long-term interim agreement right now. My sense would be you want to go for the ultimate deal. Well, the conditions don't exist for it today. If you want to get to the ultimate deal, you better change the conditions and make what isn't thinkable today thinkable tomorrow. Thank you. Good job. OK. All right. So now you can fire away. And let's start. Do we speak? Is it always people wonder when about Rafi Danziger over there? Thank you. I'm Rafi Danziger, now consultant to APAC. And my question is, since all of you uh, really are so pessimistic about the uh, prospects for peace and the possibility of a stalemate is very real, and we heard about Tanzim now becoming just as strong as the uh, uh, official forces of the PA, is there a real possibility that all, if all that continues, despite uh, Trump's best efforts, there could be a third intifada coming up? Thank you. Well, I, I do not think so. I think that what we see, this habba, uh, uh, as they call it, since last September, the stabbings, the caramings, etc., they call it habba, some sort of an eruption, not intifada, and not by chance. Intifada now is a bad word uh, in Palestinian jargon. The majority uh, views the second intifada, Arafat's, if you want, Barghouti's intifada, as a major catastrophe as a failure, and people don't want to go back there. And this is one of the reasons, not all, the only one, that the people involved in the Habba uh, are all young. They have no recollection uh, of the Intifada of, uh, uh, of 2000. Uh, the Palestinian pub public is not inclined to have another round uh, in Israel. And if anybody, I don't want to go into too many details, if anybody uh, is interested in the special characteristics of this uh, violent haba, um, I wrote an article uh, last year for American Interest, uh, which you can look, look up, but the latest, for example, was a mother of nine children, an elderly lady. She had some uh, quarrel with her husband about education of the children. She takes a knife and shows it to the Israeli border police and gets arrested. And 90% of the cases are variations uh, of this story. One word, if I can, about what Danny said in the past. You know, even before Arafat uh, accepts Israel's uh, or the national movement than the Israeli narrative, there is one thing which would be uh, very meaningful. It's for Abbas to recognize that there is Jewish history in the land and especially in Jerusalem. The Palestinian national movement for over a century refused to get to the point where they acknowledge that there was a, any Jewish history in Jerusalem. That would be very meaningful and would not cost him that much. Wait, you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I am less certain uh, than you, Ehud. I see some of the components of uh, intifada, breakdown, call it what you will, there. The lack of legitimacy that the PA is uh, facing right now weakens the political control uh, mechanisms that we, the Palestinian society has. The lack of faith that uh, Dennis talked about in the peace process makes things uh, quite volatile. Yes, so far we have uh, not had that, but as you mentioned, there's a generation that doesn't remember 
uh, the cost of the old uh, intifada. Much of what has been uh, preventing the intifada is some of the work of the Palestinian security forces. But this is not sustainable. In my view, there is there needs to be the kind of signals that uh, Dennis talked about. We certainly need to uh, help the security cooperation and strengthen the Palestinian security sector. But also we need to start working on an issue that we are not raised today, which is the issue of how do you re-legitimize the Palestinian Authority through dealing with issues of governance, of issues of corruption, of issues of opening the political space. If not, the pressure cooker is there. And as we saw in the last two intifadas, these things happen when least expected. These things are triggered often by accidents or by random events. I fear we are in a very similar situation. Okay, Dan Pollack, right here. Dan Pollock with the Zionist Organization of America. Uh, directing at uh, Wraith, mainly, but others can speak too. Uh, I worry that you guys aren't being pessimistic enough. <laughs> so the question that you, the way you put it was to probe the Palestinian ability to reach a deal. Can we talk a little bit about what happens if President Trump asks this of Abbas, for example, Dennis's two proposals, and he either says no outright or says yes conditionally and then doesn't follow through because he isn't able to. Mm -hmm. Then we will lay bare the fact that there really isn't any short-term progress to be made even to have singles. And you guys talk about that a little bit. Thank you. Do you want, um, Dennis, do you want to start on that? Well, look, I mean, you, you start by testing the proposition and seeing. I was suggesting that I think the president has a lot of leverage. Uh, and that's why I think that, in fact, Abbas, even though it's going to be difficult for him, particularly given his political context, he also has the need to prove that, he's continues, that he continues to be relevant. That's one of the things that he actually needs for his political circumstances. So, you know, I'm, I'm, my guess is that you can get him to do something, maybe not everything we're talking about at this point, but again, you can get him to do these things, I suspect, over time. If he doesn't do it, uh, then you move back into a different direction because, you know, Israel still has a choice of how it wants to define its own future. If it stays on the current path, it becomes a binational state. It's the numbers dictate that. And I'm not, when I say that, I don't, I'm not including Gaza. I'm not one of those who includes Gaza. You can't have it, you can't have the Israelis withdraw, and then when they withdraw, you don't count it when they withdraw. Uh, under yeah. those circumstances, you give the Israelis a reason not to withdraw. So they withdrew. But the numbers today are about 6238. So when it's 6040 or it's 5842, what kind of a what kind of a Jewish state is it? So many, at least among younger Palestinians right now, they have an attitude, they have a strategy, which, you know, if what you're saying takes place, their attitude is, you know what? Let the Israelis stay where they are, let's just have one person, one vote. Uh, so Abbas has to decide in the end, is he about uh, wanting a legacy where he's not accused of being a betrayer, in which case he deflects. His whole approach in this meeting is to deflect. He tries to get away not doing anything, saying, all right, we'll keep, we do the security cooperation, which is, Ray said, it's very important. We'll stop internationalization, but I can't do anything else. I mean, I can, I can meet with Netanyahu, but that's, it's not going to lead anywhere. So you're then faced with, all right, what do you do at that point? Uh, and it seems to me, you know, we and the Israelis should then have a conversation about if the Israelis have taken steps and the Palestinians haven't, that suggests that we look for ways to present that and frame that publicly as a way of, of gaining some credit for the Israelis, as a way of still trying to do something more with the Arabs and the Europeans, as a way of looking for vehicles to put more pressure on the Palestinians. Look, one thing about the Palestinians, the one self-image they have is that they have, they have achieved one thing, and it's not the PA, is that they, they acquired international legitimacy for their cause. On the world stage, they are seen as having a legitimate cause. If they're not prepared to do anything, uh, then you have to focus on, all right, how can you do enough with the Israelis to then try to reshape that reality so the Palestinians become under more pressure uh, and they understand that what could be put at risk for them is whether or not their cause retains a sense of legitimacy. All right. Um, 
bef- I'll just add, Dan, that, you know, I, does he realize that it's a new era? Uh, I mean, is, is, that's how I hear your question. We don't know. We'll know soon enough. Uh, but I think the fact that he offered this thing to direct talks without preconditions, um, you know, you could say, well, didn't he say something in Moscow last year that he would ho- let the Russians host something? It is true. So it's in a sense that in and of itself, it, it isn't new. But I think that he's, he's very aware that Barack Obama is not president anymore. And, I th- and uh, whether it's to maintain regional relevance, international relevance, the Fatah's card is that they are the face of, 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 inter- of, of interface with the international community. And so I, I do think he wants to be relevant to Trump. Does that mean he'll follow through on, on some of this? You know, it's to be seen. I don't think any of us are making grand predictions that we're so confident he will. But, um, but I think that it's, it seems clear by some of his statements, what we're hearing from people around him is that they're very aware that Barack Obama is in president. And if that leads him to, you know, do some of these asks, we'll, we'll know soon enough. Mm. Howard Sumka. Thanks. Um, I, I agree completely. We're not at a place for a grand deal and, and that we need to be thinking about interim kinds of things. And one of the things that, uh, that always strikes me when I think back on the 20 or more years since Oslo, uh, from my perspective, uh, the Palestinians have really gotten very little out of, out of this process. And without um, glossing over their own deficiencies, it seems to me the model has always been to punish the Palestinians for some transgression and to reward the Israelis for whatever, whatever they've done. And for example, Dennis, uh, Shuhada Street, as, as the, as the uh, reward to the Palestinians for, for the Hebron redeployment agreement, that uh, fell apart in no time. The street was rehabilitated, the businesses were set up, and within a matter of months, Palestinians couldn't walk on the street, and they still can't walk on the street. Um, why don't we try to focus on the kinds of concrete things that will, in fact, I suspect, improve the view of the Palestinian public? We, we, talk, about, we talk about how weak Abu Mazen is, but we, we've given Abu Mazen very little. No incentives, no rewards for the security cooperation that they've undertaken with Israel. And to the person on the street in Palestine, it just looks like everything is going against them. There's a hundred videos on YouTube showing settlers attacking Palestinian farmers and the IDF either turning its back to it or even protecting the, the settlers. And as long as that goes on, I don't think you'll ever get the Palestinian public lined up behind a peace agreement. Um, look, there is uh, there's no question that on the Palestinian side, the ability to show what they have produced is clearly limited. But the the eighty percent who look at the Palestinian Authority as being corrupt, that's driven by their view of bad governance and corruption and a lack of rule of law. Uh, it isn't to say that they're happy about the, Palestin- uh, about the Israelis or they think they've achieved what they need to, but their sole measure in terms of evaluating the PA is not only what it does vis-a-vis or what it hasn't achieved vis-a-vis the Israelis. Do I think that there needs to be more delivery? For sure. I mean, the kind of things I would like to see, there's three things I'd like to see done on the Israeli side. Um, one is I'd like to see no building outside the blocks. I'd like to see a declaration there'll be no sovereignty to the east of the security barrier. And I'd like to see a real opening of Area C, where you might actually see a real difference in terms of economic payoff for Palestinians. But I also think, and I didn't say this, but this is something Rath and I have talked about. Uh, I do think there are things that can be held out that Trump can offer in terms of greater economic incentives and producing genuine investment, not just more assistance, but it requires transparency on the Palestinian side. It requires some institution building on the Palestinian side. Uh, Here you can actually offer something, but you can also require something at the same time. So, you know, look, I think there there is a need to show Palestinians they have something to gain but along with those gains have to come a set of responsibilities as well. Um, you know, um, 
one of the reasons that I talked about briefly the issue of economics and security cooperation because I see a lot that can be delivered there. If you look now as a result of the security cooperation over the last few years, what we have seen, particularly in Israel, particularly in the IDF, you know, a desire to do more of the stuff that uh, Dennis was talking about, some with territorial components like access to Area C, others relating to investment, etc., uh, etc. Et the list of projects and the list of steps are there. Um, often what we have seen, the IDF being advocating these and the blockage coming from the political echelon particularly when Barack was uh, defense minister and uh, less so today. One of the asks that we can ask from the states uh, to Israel is, you know what? Buffer this. Allow the security folks, as long as uh, cooperation continues in an acceptable way, to manage that relation. Allow the IDF to start implementing some of these issues. That's one thing we can ask the Palestinians and the Israelis. This is something that's working, security cooperation. Do not politicize it. Do not mess with it. I think if we create this buffer, a lot of what you're talking about can actually happen. And frankly, nothing uh, impacts public opinion as much as concrete change that affects their life. One of the reasons that I believe, for example, the internationalization um, strategy did not produce any real uh, political gain for Abbas because the public was looking at it and yeah, fine, another UN resolution. How is that changing my life? So there is a lot that can be done there. And this is something we can pay attention to. And by the way, we have a presence on the ground through the U.S. security coordinator, an exemplary three-star general who is doing that, who we can empower to have these kinds of conversation. But the point that De Dennis and David raised, the idea of asking Israel to do something on settlements, that's also very, very important. Recognizing that whatever the U.S. and Israel agree on on settlements will not be sufficient for Palestinians. Putting that aside, I think the fact that the Palestinians see that we are exerting pressure on Israel privately behind the closed door, but ultimately in a way that delivers, could resonate. I used to be an official when the Bush Sharon letter was a Palestinian official when it was signed. Of course, publicly and officially, we were against it. Privately, we saw that as a signal that you have a serious American president who is willing to actually... Um, push towards very specific and very meaningful uh, steps. So I think a combination of opening that space, creating, allowing the security folks to do what they think uh, is right, and at the same time, signal from our end to the Palestinians that we're willing to engage Israel in a tough conversation as we engage the Palestinians in a tough conversation. This is the kind of balance I would like to see. I would just, if I could add, and I don't know if Aoud wants to say something, but I, you know, and when Wraith mentions the security p political dynamic inside Israel, Look, it's a case-by-case -case basis, and the security people, uh, you know, cannot always crow about their successes. But one of the real changes is that the, I think the IDF is emerging as a stabilizer at a time of a diplomatic vacuum. And um, look, during the the stabbing, uh, how about whatever, uh, when they had 250 people being stabbed on the Israeli side, you can imagine the politicians clamored in the cabinet for closure, extensive closure, and the military pushed back. And they said, if we close down the West Bank, we just guarantee that this violence will spread. And Gadi Eisenkot, the chief of staff, I think pushed hard. And uh, the military was vindicated. They, they didn't push back. They didn't uh, do the closure like the politicians wanted. And I think one of the things now, uh, picking up what Wraith said about security cooperation, is clearly uh, enabling the Palestinian police to... Um, to have policing authority of Area B as called for in Oslo too. And I used to say, isn't that, shouldn't that have already happened? Isn't that in the agreement? Well, a lot of things in the agreement have not exactly materialized. Um, there's signs that, you know, that the military is, is wanting this. Uh, they, they, they've, they've dropped incursions, but n not to zero, which is where the Palestinians wanted at in, in Area A. That's clear. But I think the real shift in the last several years is that the IDF and the security services are emerging I don't want to use the word Palestinian lobbyists in the Israeli political system. That would be going too far. But uh, Poli Mordechai, uh, who's the head of the coordinator in the territory, so Howard, do you know him? I mean, he's someone uh, who's pushed on a lot of these uh, agreements on electricity and some of these other issues. And I think that it's, it's a real shift uh, from the past where you used to meet with these generals and they'd say, ah, Palestinian issue, we got Iran, we got Hamas. I mean, you had Tamir Pardo now saying... Uh, the former head of the Mossad say the the one existential threat to Israel is is the occupation of Palestinians. Um, it's a real shift, uh, and it's to see it is is remarkable. And so I don't mean to say the cup is full, but I I, I don't I, I think that that's an interesting dynamic uh, to keep track of. Yeah, just to 
short uh, historical remark. You've been saying, you have said that the Palestinians did not see much results from the Oslo Accords. So just for the record, Arafat returns to the land in 94. In 95, he gives the signal to Hamas to go for suicide operations. That's Hamas saying, not Ehud. March 97, he starts distri distributing arms to the Tanzim. And I can go on and on and on. This is the context. And if somebody is not aware of the fact, Rabin, summer 95, was bent on presenting Arafat with an ultimatum about the terrorist activity. Unfortunately, he was uh, assassinated in November. Before that, he was convinced to serve this ultimatum and have this bend or break meeting with Arafat after the first Palestinian general uh, elections, which were scheduled for January 96. Rabin was not there to serve the ultimatum, and Perez, God bless his soul, always sounded differently. But this is the context. This is how it happened. Okay, Can I, I want to just give the, actual, <coughs> the historical footnote. <laughs> On November 1st, 1995, three days before the assassination, I'm meeting with Rabin, and this, by the way, was the high point of the relationship that he had with Arafat and the PA. And he said to me, because I was about to go down to Gaza and see Arafat, he said to me, I need you to raise with Arafat what's going on with the Hamas infrastructure, terrorist infrastructure uh, in Gaza. Um, it has to stop. This is, you know, this is November 1st. You know, the uh, September 28th is when the interim agreement was signed. Uh, and I said to him, you know, look, I will do it, but don't ask me that way. Give me the specifics. If I go and say you got to do something about the Hamas terrorist infrastructure, he'll say okay, and it'll mean nothing. I have to have specifics. Tell me what the specifics are so I can then hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. And he thought about it, and he said, you know what? Let us do it first. That was the backdrop to this. Okay. So or Muhammad Daif was the number one of the police, and Ibrahim Akadmi. Or Inir. Um, hi, I'm Orimir with Americans for Peace Now. I have two uh, quick questions. One is, uh, Ehud mentioned the, uh, the uh, possible scenario of uh, Hamas becoming to Gaza what Hezbollah is to Lebanon. And I'm wondering, Ehud, if you could say a few words about your scenario, how, how it's going to happen, how do you see it maybe happening, and if others on the panel uh, share this uh, scenario and, and what they think about it. The other question that I have is uh, for Dennis. Dennis, you mentioned the, uh, the importance of Abbas feeling that there's a price for saying no to Trump. My question is, do you think that it's also important for Bibi, for Netanyahu, to know that there's a price for saying no, having um, said so many no's to, to Obama? Uh, Ori, uh, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying Hamas is prepared, or rather, many in Hamas are prepared. It has nothing to do with the new charter. They are prepared to surrender services, governors in Gaza, to Abbas. Abbas was saying until now that he doesn't want to be a subcontractor in Gaza. So I don't know that it's going to happen. But Hamas, in my opinion, is well prepared to be a Hezbollah, to retain their force, stronger than the Palestinian security organs uh, in Gaza, let the government, let the PA do whatever, services and governance in Gaza, and then they gain uh, uh, opening of the doors to the West Bank which is where they really want to go. They are ready for the deal. 
You know, I am again less uh, less certain than uh, Ehud on this. Uh, this might be the view from the military wing in Hamas, and granted, the military wing is on the ascendance. I'm not sure this is the view of the whole of the Hamas organization. Despite of what Mishal said, governing Gaza was a boon for them. In the sense, this is the first time that uh, a group of that kind has governed territory and uh, population. They've used it to uh, consolidate their base through giving uh, jobs, through uh, all of these economic incentives. It's very hard to imagine them giving up on all of these uh, aspects. Maybe once the Hamas election, they might start uh, shifting direction in that course, but it won't be an easy one. It will be a huge pushback from some of the Hamas political uh, actors in Gaza itself to give up that uh, that uh, tool. So I don't see it, see them that ready for it. Sinwar might be there. I'm not sure the rest of the movement is there. I'll make one quick comment on this and then I'll answer your question. Um, as Ehud said, you know, there's been a hesitancy on, on Abu Mazen's part. You know, after the after 2014, there was a push by the Egyptians and us to get them to go in and take over the crossing points, and Abu Mazen wouldn't do it. Uh, and I think the same rationale might still apply. So we'll have to see. It's possible that if, you know, if he hears enough that people are raising the question of whether or not you can produce an agreement so long as you don't have any influence in Gaza, then maybe he looks at that somewhat differently. And then the question that I think race is raising becomes quite relevant. Uh, the answer, yeah, on, on BB, yes. I mean, it's a uh, the this president has leverage on both sides. On the Israeli side, he has particular leverage also because the imagery that there was a problem, it was easy to say, oh, the problem you see, it's gone now because Obama's gone. So now, if you end up with a problem, it turns out it wasn't just Obama. So I think that that gives him leverage. It just depends on how he chooses to use it. I would add, look, yes, Netanyahu cannot afford a break with Trump because that really changes the whole narrative that uh, he wasn't the problem, but he was, he was met with an unreasonable president. If he can't get along with, you know, all his life he's wanted a Republican president, <laughs> he's got one, and uh, if he can't work out with him, that I think is, that creates internal problems for him. Uh, on the Abbas and Gaza, and I leave Hamas to Ayod and Wraith to sort out, I, I really don't know. But I do think that he pays somewhat of a, you know, you look at the Shakaki polls, and when you say two-thirds want him to resign, I think part of it is from my conversations with Palestinians is he, he hasn't seemed to care about Gaza. I mean, Gaza's had a huge humanitarian issue now for years there. They got, what, like six hours of electricity a day. Um, and, um, you know, he, where, where is their leader? I mean, uh, you know, I think just talking, you know, going back, and there are a lot of, it's hard to make really strict analogies here, but if you go back to the Zionist movement in the 1930s, Ben-Gurion felt he had a compromise on, on a, with the Peel Commission because uh, Jews were dying in Nazi Germany. I mean, at a certain point, if, you, if you're a leader and you care about your public, you can't be indifferent to their suffering. It doesn't mean that they're, you know, they, there aren't other culprits, et cetera. But I do think at a certain point, this idea that I'm just going to wash my hands of Gaza, blame the Israelis for everything, okay, that works for some. But I, when I look at his, his poor polling numbers in Gaza and elsewhere, I, I do think there's an, a corrosive you know, uh, thing going on here that he is, he's viewed as indifferent. I mean, it's years. You know, he hasn't been in Gaza in 10 years. And he didn't use the moment right after the Gaza war ended. He could have sent Rami Hamdallah and just taken over, and he didn't. So anyway, I do think that he is paying some sort of a price. Mark Ginsburg. Gentlemen, um, is Madrid, uh, the waters in Madrid, good this time of year? Uh, the reason why I ask the question is that I think that all of you have been so focused on the bilateral. I think the White House is thinking uh, a big deal. And they're thinking about a regional conference. And I'm wondering if, when and if, uh, Trump asks Abbas if he's willing to participate in a regional conference that would address uh, not only the Palestinian issue, but other issues of importance to the United States, uh, what is Abbas going to demand in return? Dennis, you want to start on that? Can I? Look, I mean, in some ways, uh, Look, the ability, as Dennis mentioned, to have 
a regional approach will very much depend on how much the region sees the U.S. as being serious and focused on other issues of interest to the region, primarily Iran. You want to get the Saudis and the Gulf uh, to be involved, show them that you are serious uh, on Iran. What we've seen so far is signals from the administration, and they're responding with signals. This is a dance that still uh, has to go. So I think, in a sense, until you get to that uh, point where they are sure that we are all in in this uh, issue, don't expect them to be all in uh, in the uh, regional uh, approach. But there are ways of drawing them uh, in earlier on. From my perspective, for example, this... this uh, idea that I'm proposing of having this ongoing dialogue between the PA and the United States, if I were the president, I would actually invite the Arabs to participate in that. I would invite them to participate, first of all, to see how serious they are about uh, playing the role that we see for them in an ultimate process, pushing and also supporting the Palestinians at the same time, to draw them in uh, in that and and, and to test them. So these are all uh, possibilities out there. Now, Abbas, if he sees serious Arab willingness to engage in a process like this, he can't say no. If you block all of the uh, exit ramps for him, if he goes to every Arab capital and say, look, we're going to go, and uh, if you decide not to go, you're on your own, he cannot say uh, no to that. But to get to uh, the Arabs, to get to that point, requires the Arabs to get what they want from the United States. And I repeat, that relates mainly to Iran. Yeah, I was going to pick up what Ray said. He can't say no. If they're all willing to come, he's not going to be the one not to go. So it's not like he can ask something for going. So I don't, I think the question is whether or not you can create this meeting, but not as a one-off. If you're trying to change the psychology of the region and trying to show that something can actually be done, one of the things you have to demonstrate is if you organize a meeting like this, you have a series of outcomes from it, a series of results from it. If you organize this meeting, we've seen this movie before. We've had it before. So if you're actually trying to show something's different this time, the meeting only creates that sense if there's a series of outputs or results. Now. You know, do the Arab states have an interest in doing it? Yeah, but I think it's it's tied to their seeing that the re- that we will stay in the region and in a way that takes on the threats that most matter to them. Uh, and um, you know, I I, <laughs> I suspect that uh, having a big meeting does appeal to the administration. But my impression is that they understand it doesn't make sense just to hold a meeting and have nothing come of it. That, that's my impression as well. A month ago, I was thinking more like Mark, and I've, I don't think that's the case. Now, maybe it'll swing back, and there's certainly probably people in the White House who think the president would love to be at a ceremony with a lot of flags and Arabs and Israelis all together. But if the result is like a thud, then does that really make the president look good? Um, I'm not sure. So I, I'm, not as, I'm not as certain about a regional conference. Back there. Just, uh, one second. Just, just a little uh, b- background. It was the sacred tenet of mm-hmm. Arafat and the Fatah movement. What they called in Arabic is the Klaliyat al Karar al Palestini, the independence of Palestinian decision making. This is what Pat- Fatah was about since the late 50s. Abbas, by going back a few years ago, back to the Arab League, has changed it and make the regional possible. Okay, uh, gentlemen back there. Oh, th- and then thank you so much for your interesting and thoughtful presentations. Um, my question, my name is Abraham Avidor, retired Foreign Service. Uh, to what extent are European allies, in, in particular England and France are included in the, uh, in the peace process? Uh, historically, uh, both countries had um, a major role in the region, starting with Napoleon's invasion of Egypt over 200 years ago, and then the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the Sinai operation, um, and, and colonial involvement, and so on and so on. Uh, during the Six Days War, there was mentioned here, uh, which I happen to serve as a young lieutenant in the Israeli Air Force, the entire Israeli Air Force consisted of, of French planes, and the nuclear facility in Dimona was French, and so on and so on. So France and England traditionally, historically, uh, had a major role in the region, and my question is if they are going to be consulted or included uh, in this uh, peace process, or is this strictly an American project? Sure. Um, sure. Look, I mean, uh, European 
an apology to European diplomats in the room, but uh, the European role right now is not as uh, central. Right now, actually traditionally always, the U.S. has to lead because no one else uh, has the assets that you need uh, for such a leadership. Um, today, the Arabs are much more important because of uh, the regional dynamic and the domestic Palestinian dynamic. It doesn't mean, though, that the Europeans have no role. There's a role that you can imagine that is similar to the traditional law role, a supportive uh, role uh, around the margins. But also, you know, if you zoom out a little bit, if what we are expecting from the United States to play some tough love with the Israelis, we love you, but you have to do certain things. We should expect similar things from the Europeans. The Europeans traditionally in some of these fora, for example, the quartet, have really played the role of the spokesperson for the Palestinians. I'm exaggerating, but not by much. Uh, right now, it's a time to say, okay, you want to be relevant, use your good relations with the Palestinians to gently, privately, but uh, clearly push them to some of the things that they uh, have to do. They have quite a, lev- a bit of leverage on that. But again, they will not be a central player. It has to be U.S.-led. And if there's going to be another central player, it will be the traditional U.S. allies in the Arab world. I would just add that, you know, 2011 was that moment of the tough love with the Obama speech on 67 and swaps. And I think that was an important speech. I think it needed to have been followed up by a European analog to the Palestinians on the refugees that would have said, you know, just as the patron of Israel has told Israel what it won't get, we're going to have to tell you that too. I think the closest they've ca- they came maybe was at the Paris conference at the last days of the Obama administration where they endorsed Kerry's six points, which included a Jewish state and things like that. But frankly, the Paris conference didn't leave uh, much of a mark, I think. And um, so I don't know. But the, the, there are things that clearly the Europeans can do. But I don't know if, if they're going to be out front here. I think it's we're going to we're going to I think, you know, Abbas is waiting also to see where's Trump. I think that is the most important question. Um, OK, right here. This gentleman's been waiting for a while. Well, I understand there's some skepticism among people here about securing the ultimate deal. Time and time again, President Trump has mentioned it as his goal. Now, my question is, in your conversations with senior Trump administration officials, have they understood that in order to get an ultimate deal, it has to deal with some of the questions like division of East Jerusalem, withdrawal from a vast majority of the West Bank, also including this, the refugee issue. Have they gotten into any of these details in your conversation, or how else are they going to secure an ultimate deal? Dennis, I'll let you start this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, my impression is that they're, they're in the process of uh, forming their judgment still. Uh, they are talking to uh, you know, to all the parties, they're getting a sense of where they're coming from, and I think that, you know, they're trying to approach this in a in a thoughtful fashion, and I think they, at this point, understand that this is uh, a pretty large lift, uh, but I think they're still determined to press ahead, and they, they certainly their guidance from the president is he wants he's very serious about this, and he, no one should, you know, I. David started off by sort of saying maybe this is just, uh, again, the the style of of making big statements to begin with. I think it reflects his belief uh, and his interest and his seriousness about wanting to see this. Uh, You know, he calls it the ultimate deal. He's not unique to American presidents deciding they want to do this. You know, Franklin Roosevelt, you know, at one point toyed with the idea that after he was president, maybe he would go to the Holy Land and fix the problem. Uh, Ronald Reagan bears his name on one plan, the Reagan Peace Plan. Jimmy Carter used to talk about how this issue preyed on his mind. For Bill Clinton, this was a a mission. Uh, many American presidents have looked at this issue for a variety of different reasons, maybe because, you know, no one else could could do it. Maybe because it's the Holy Land. Maybe it's because the birthplace of, of religions. I mean, whatever the reason, it's not unique to have American presidents decide that this is an issue that they want to be known for resolving. Uh, and so the fact that this president says that, yeah, it's in keeping that he wants to show that he's able to achieve what others can't achieve. But it doesn't make him unusual because there's plenty of his, plenty of his predecessors have approached it very much the same. 
All right, last question, Peter Rosenblatt. Thank you, David. What are the Sunni Arab states looking for Trump to do vis-a-vis -vis Iran? What they're looking for him to do is uh, first demonstrate that he takes the threat as seriously as they do, because the perception they had of President Obama, fairly or not, was that he didn't see it the way they saw it. When he gave, you know, when he talked in the, uh, in the multiple interviews with Jeffrey Goldberg about the Saudis should share the region with the Iranians, um, that was, that sort of validated their perception that he didn't understand the nature of the kind of existential threat that the Iranians were posing to them. So it's take the nature of the threat seriously, come up with a strategy, by the way, which where he can ask of them to take steps, um, but he can, but in a sense, a strategy that counters the Iranians in the region, raises the cost to them of what they're doing, uh, at a minimum contains them, uh, and at a maximum makes it clear to the Iranians that they have a lot to lose by continuing to do what they're doing. If they perceive that, he can ask them to do something on ISIS, on Iran, and also, I think, on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, but we shouldn't have any illusions. To the extent to which you bring the Arab states into this, and I think there is a potential and there's a need, because I think <laughs> Abu Mazen, you know, even, you know, even if he doesn't want the Arabs to be telling him what to do, he needs their cover. Regardless, he needs their cover. On his own, it's very difficult for him to take any of these decisions. But the Israelis needed, too, an Arab cover because the disbelief of the Palestinians is so great on the Israeli side that if you're going to make a concession towards the Palestinians, uh, the most Israelis need to see that they're getting something from the Arabs because they don't believe they get anything from the Palestinians. So the, the problem, I think, in the end is uh, bringing the Arabs in is important, but the Arabs are not going to do this on the cheap. Yes, they want Trump in the region. Yes, they're prepared to do some things. Yes, they're prepared maybe to do more and be more engaged in this issue and play a role that they haven't in the past. But they need to put themselves in a position where it looks like they're delivering for the Palestinians what they couldn't deliver for themselves. They need to become the sort of the, 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 the ones who, who fulfill Palestinian national aspirations. So the idea you could have an outcome where you have a Palestinian entity embedded in, in a larger Israeli state they won't be a party to that. All right, Ehud, you get the last word. Um, I think that the Sunni Arabs understand that uh, in Tehran there is a wide consensus that the priority goes to the Levant and not to the Persian Gulf. And that's very important. Number two, I think that the Sunni Arab states understand and they discuss it, that Iran is in the process, will take time, of be, uh, having the building blocks of one, probably two land corridors, which will not be uh, uh, permanent, but a situation in which whenever necessary, Iran can piece together land corridors and not remain reliant on air supplies which as the Israeli Air, Air Force proves once and, and, and again, is difficulty. Uh, I think what they want to see is that the United States is helping disrupt uh, the, uh, this game plan of the Iranians to obtain and maintain predominance in the Levant. Okay, I want to thank my panel and I want to thank you all for coming. Stay tuned. Thank you all very much. <laughs>